I'm Evan Moffick. I'm in Chicago, Illinois, and I'd like to be your rabbi. Awesome. Right. Hey, welcome. Welcome to the Happy Hippie Jesus Show. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. I bet I'm your first rabbi you've interviewed. You are our first <laughs> rabbi, and I'm really excited because Bill's got these goofy ideas about Jesus, and <laughs> I think if anyone can set him straight, it's going to be you. So I'm going to get some popcorn while you talk to Bill about who Jesus really is. <laughs> you got to ask him the question, dude. You can't just say who Jesus is. Dude, I'm not asking a rabbi your goofy idea about Jesus. Okay. You've got to do that yourself. All right, Evan, I tend to think that Jesus is kind of a hippie. What do you think? Well, you know, I think that's probably accurate. I, I definitely, I think he's a rabbi. I think Jesus was a rabbi and he, and, uh, you know, perhaps some of the rabbinic ideas about the world may be associated with the hippies. They're definitely countercultural to the culture we live in today. Jeremy, you just can't, you just can't win, buddy. Every time Bill picks a guest, this is the answer. I think he screens all of you. Is that like in the screening process? He's like, you can come on the show if you'll say this about Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's like self-selecting, right? Yeah, probably. I mean, if you if you didn't think Jesus was a hippie, you'd get the invite. And you'd be like, I don't know about that show. <laughs> One of the things we love, I guess, to hear and I'd be interested to yours is just tell us a story about how you understand God. It can be from your own life or from, you know, the scriptures or Torah or whatever you would like. Just a story that'll illustrate a little bit about how you understand God. I think probably I've seen God. I think probably the deepest impact stories for me where my faith has been strongest have been through tragedies where I've just seen people who have lost children who have suffered immensely, somehow go on with life and live with purpose and even sometimes live with a sense of joy. And when I see people who are able to survive and even thrive after going through what would just destroy someone else, I realize that there's a deeper power that we can hold on to. And so it's being a rabbi, being a teacher, being a counselor, being there with people who truly inspire me by, by going through difficult times and somehow emerging on the other side, that that's what convinced me there is a God. There's more in the universe than we're aware of. So to me, it, it comes through those experiences. So you find God when we need God the most. Yeah, and, and even when we need God most, but even sometimes where other people would give up on God. Those are moments, you know, especially I think sometimes it's easy to believe in God in the abstract. Where you say, you know, you, or if you're Christian, maybe you go to church some, you know, every Sunday or a couple times a year, when however much people go and, you know, you say prayers and, you know, there's a God in the universe. Sure, there's a higher power. I believe, you know, I'm spiritual, but not religious, yada, yada, yada. And you can kind of just, I mean, I think most Americans have some sort of belief in God. So I think that's easy in the abstract, but it's when those difficult times when we need God, but even more, when sometimes we could lose that faith, if our faith is too easy, it's, e you know, easy come, easy go, right? And so it's truly the, the inspire, the, the moments when I feel God most clearly are when people somehow hold on through those difficult times. And, and I've seen, I've seen it have the opposite effect. I've seen people lose their faith. I've seen a sense of deep loss during those times. So I think it, it's all the more poignant for me when people hold on. I've noticed yeah. in Christianity, and I don't know if this is true in Judaism, but in the United States, there doesn't seem to be an actual awe of God. Do you mm -hmm. notice that as well in your congregations or in just in people in general? Yeah, I think you're right. There is some of that awe has been lost. I, I think some of it, you know, in, in the rabbinic, in the Jewish community, it used to be that rabbis kind of, you know, preached on high and there were choirs and organs and there was this, a deep sense. Like if you look at old synagogues, they're built almost like these magnificent cathedrals. And there was a sense of, of awe. And I think today we live in a more informal culture. And I think some of that has been lost, which is sad because I do think we all feel sometimes that that need for something much, much bigger than ourselves. There's a wonderful reading in the Jewish prayer book that says, God, you are as close to us as breathing. 
and yet farther than the most distant star. So I think that there's something to me that's those are two powerful images. God is both right here, right and so easily accessible, but God is also so vast we can't even we can't even imagine it. Wow. Now I want a Jewish prayer book. <laughs> sure. That's a great prayer. You are our first rabbi to be on the show. So if it's okay, I want to take a couple of minutes and kind of help our audience get acquainted with what it means to be a rabbi and some elements of Judaism. If that's all right with you, how would you say being a rabbi compares to like a Christian pastor? What is it that do those compare closely or are there some distinctions that people should be aware of? It's interesting. I, I, as I've gotten to know more pastors, I think the main difference in some ways, being a rabbi is almost a combination of being a pastor, like a, a Protestant pastor and a Catholic priest, because we have both of them. You know, I think what I've noticed, I do many more life cycle events, weddings, funerals, bar mitzvahs than your typical Christian minister. Like my, my friends who are ministers, they spend a lot of their week, you know, preparing for sermons, preparing for Sunday. You know, th- there's, there's a greater focus on that worship element. Which is, of course, important in, in my world, in the, in the Jewish world. But there's also a, uh, there, there's a lot more time, I think, devoted to those kind of, of life cycle, uh, experiences, similar to with Catholic priests being, you know, so, so involved in, in the life cycle. I also think there's probably a little bit more teaching in terms of teaching classes. In many ways, I teach a lot of, I, I my, my pastor friends often teach the confirmation class at their churches, but, I'm teaching, you know, multiple times a week. I think I spend less time as a rabbi on my sermons. I mean, I certainly, you know, spend time writing sermons, but it's not the central focus as I often see it being in a church. That's interesting. And I'd just be curious, in a Protestant church, the sermon tends to be the highlight of the service or what it all builds to. Right. Is that the same in your service? Not really. Not really. A couple times a year, you know, when we have the big Jewish holidays, which are coming up in a, about two months, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, that's when the sermons are really the high point. But typically during the week, our weekly service, sometimes, sometimes the sermon is, is, is the high point, but oftentimes it's the musical pieces. It's the sense of community, almost the fellowship, because Judaism is, is not really a religion. I mean, it is a religion, but it's also is a culture, a people, a community. And so there's, there's less emphasis on the sermon and more emphasis on kind of just the experience of coming together in worship. I'm just curious, as a Christian minister, I've noticed that in these life events, the number of funerals that we do just increases exponentially in December because of people hanging on till Christmas. In Judaism, do you find that your funerals increase near Rosh Hashanah or some of your holier days? Absolutely. Absolutely, they do. And uh, I notice it. They, they also do also increase around uh, Thanksgiving. I've noticed that as well, which, you know, it's sort of this Amer- American holiday, but people do hold on through Thanksgiving. Uh, often, sometimes, even around grandchildren's bar or bat mitzvah, uh, which is their coming of age ceremony at 13 or, or even sometimes a grandchild's wedding. It's, it's amazing the human spirit, how people hold on even through pain to, 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 to get to sacred moments. So you have written this book recently that has come out called First the Jews. Could you tell us a little bit about what you mean by First the Jews? Well, so there's a couple of reasons for the title. So my original reason was it's about anti-Semitism, so hatred and hostility towards Jews. And first, the Jews was sort of this this idea that Jews are often the miners' canary. That before there were electronic ways of of knowing what was going on in mines, miners used to send a canary down to see if a mine was too dangerous for people to go in there. And if the canary died, you knew not to go into that uh, to that area that part of the mind. And so Jews, the idea is that when societies target Jews and persecute Jews and hate Jews, you know, they hate everybody else. They hate anyone who is different. So the Nazis didn't just hate Jews. They hated gay people. They hated the handicapped. 
They hated anybody who didn't fit a certain ideal of who they were supposed to be. So I chose that title because a rise in anti-Semitism means that there's going to be a rise in bigotry more generally, and we're living in a more divisive society. And so to me, part of, part of the reason for that title is I want people who are not Jewish to be aware of the growth of anti-Semitism to, for Christians, Muslims, you know, people who are secular to care about this issue because it doesn't just affect Jews. It affects all people of faith and just all good people, even people of no faith, that, that they should be concerned about the rise of, of anti-Semitism. The second reason first the Jews made sense as a title is, of course, it's a quotation from uh, the Gospel of Paul, you know, where, where he's talking about first the Jews in terms of evangelizing, that that wasn't the idea that I had with the, with the book, but it, it, the, the, the words themselves resonate uh, for Christians. And my publisher is, a Meth- is, is of course, uh, Abingdon Press, which is the Methodist Church. And so they they loved the the idea of the title and and the title itself and it's worked out well. One of the things that you really do well is well you manage to stomp on my toes a lot and oh, yeah. everyone by just raising awareness of kind of issues and how things have kind of an anti-semitic vibe or an anti-semitic vibe that maybe we're not aware of. Sure. So you want to open our eyes, I guess or our audience's eyes to a few kind of things that you see happening in culture that maybe have unintended consequences? Yeah, I think one of the, you know, one of my earlier books was called What Every Christian Needs to Know About the Jewishness of Jesus. And I think that helped me see some of the the, the stereotypes. One thing is, for, for decades, probably centuries, it was taught that the Jews killed Jesus. And that was, and, and of course, it's the, the verse from the Gospel of Matthew, his blood be on us and on our children. And that was looked at as the Jewish people for all time are to blame for the death of Jesus. Whereas that, that whole approach has led to so much hatred. And I've tried to, to, to educate people that truthfully, every, Jesus was Jewish. All the people there were Jewish. And, and it's, it's, it, it makes no sense to say the Jewish people over all time are, uh, murdered Jesus. I mean, isn't the idea, at least from, from pastors I've talked to is that, you know, humanity killed Jesus. And so it, this, this kind of false charge has led to so much hatred. And part of the history that I talk about in the book is that during Good Friday, during Holy Week, that was often the worst time to be a Jew in Europe because there would be so much pent up uh, anger often stoked by these gospel verses that led people to murder Jews, which of course is, 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 is unchristian. And so just to build a greater awareness of, of this, the danger of this charge. And I also, also talk about sort of how really, if you want to be technically right, I mean, Pontius Pilate was in charge. So it's kind of helping to, to bring a greater awareness to how certain gospel verses, there are some people sort of on, who are, who are much more radical than me who say, well, the whole New Testament is, is anti-Semitic. I mean, there's, and I don't think that at all. I think how we look every sacred text, we have to look at it through the right lens. And so part of the reason that our Bible is so eternal and so powerful, it's the word of God and, and the word of God makes sense to us wherever we are in life and wherever we are in history. And so w- we cannot imagine that God would want us to be murdering Jewish people if we're Christian. And so we have to read the text in the right way. And that's part of what I trying to convey in the book. Also, one of the, I wrote this book really for people in the pews. You know, there's so much great inter, one of the great miracles of the 20th century is the reconciliation between Jews and Christians. I mean, after the Holocaust, the, the Pope recognized the state of Israel. There was, there was great strides in interfaith relations, but a lot of that happened at a very high level between you know, cardinals and rabbis and, and the Pope and government in the government of Israel. A lot of it didn't really reach your average Christian, your average Jew. And that's kind of what I, that was my intended audience for the book to, to sort of bring some of that message to, to people who are striving or trying to live in a world that feels so divided. And yet there's so much capability and capacity for bridge building. Yeah. The gospel of John has been a very difficult gospel for many theologians to deal with because it seems to have so much anti-Semitism, even though, honestly, it's John making commentary on his time when the Christian church is separating from Judaism. Yeah. 
But I've seen a lot of theologians try to smooth over that by refer saying, no, actually, John's talking about Judeans, not Jews. Do you have any thoughts on that? that that's one way of interpreting it. I mean, I think I think there's some legitimacy to that point of view, because at that time, when the Romans were cracking down on Jews and Christians, there was as much political tension as religious tension. So I think by saying Judeans, those interpreters are saying, you know, this was a political issue. And it was part of the reason the church in the time of John or whenever Gospel of John was written, part of the reason it's more anti-Jewish is the Romans were targeting Jews and Christians wanted to at least survive and so wanted to be on the good side of the Romans. So in some ways, as it's interesting, there's been some interesting books about this. The later the gospel, the later the Christian writing, the more anti-Jewish it is. You actually see the earliest gospel is generally Mark, right? People yeah. say Mark. And so the, the role of Pontius Pilate gets less and less as you go along. In Mark, Pontius Pilate is the one who clearly orders the death of Jesus. By the Gospel of John, Pontius Pilate sort of washing his hands of it. He's sort of saying it's the Sanhedrin. And so it, as as you get later on when, when, uh, for, for the Gospels, the the greater the villainy of the Jews. And that's political, less than, you know, I mean, it's all tied together, but there there is something political about it. I think for me, I would add, you know, you wrote a book about how Jesus was Jewish I think it's also worth remembering Paul and John are Jewish. Yes. And so on some levels, we have to read those not as all time statements, but I mean, me and my sister have some fights and some arguments and those shouldn't be taken in grand scales, but, you know, within a family dynamic. And I think it's important to understand Paul and John and some of those writings within a family dynamic or an argument that's happening within a family. No question about it. I mean, every when 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 they say his blood be upon us and on our children, these are Jews, you know, arguing with other Jews. And the interesting thing, Jesus clearly lived and died as a Jew, as a traditional Jew. You know, I mean, if, if you know, for, from a human point of view, you know, for, for, forget the divine point of view. From if you're just a regular first century Judean, you see Jesus lived and died as a Jew. Paul is really interesting. Paul is also Jewish, but by the time Paul dies. Judaism is sort of in flux. You know, there, there, there are the more traditional Jews called the Pharisees, you know, who are sticking to Jewish tradition and do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And then there are those who are followers of Paul who see themselves as Jews, but they see themselves as Jewish followers of Jesus. So the definition of Judaism had broadened by that point. So Paul still considered himself Jewish, but almost like a, a, a new sect of Judaism. And then after Paul is, of course, when that sect becomes a religion. It's, it's just so interesting. I mean, that whole period of time is so complex. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of interesting books written about how, you know, Christianity was drawing from Judaism and then rabbinic Judaism, the Pharisees were drawing from this emerging school of Christianity. There was a lot of cross pollination. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's also worth mentioning that what it means to be Jewish is up for debate during this time, particularly after the destruction of the temple. Huge. Yeah. Huge. I mean, yes, it was such a, the, the kind of Judaism we practice today, I often tell this to my congregation, This we're not practicing biblical Judaism. I mean, you open up the book of Leviticus, none of that stuff is happening anymore in the Jewish community. Now, there are tiny sects that want to bring that back, but that's not mainstream Judaism. You know, mainstream Judaism is the rabbinic or Pharisaic Judaism. And that was just one group that existed. But if, after the destruction of the temple, that was the group that that sort of survived in some ways and, and built the infrastructure to continue. So absolutely. As I read your book, I had to check my uh, white American privilege at the door. And one of the things that just really jumped out, especially it's the first chapter gets me because I honest, honestly lean left more than I do right. You can look at me and tell I'm the one with the long hair and the beard and everything. But <laughs> I don't uh, judge on appearances. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my wife says, my wife says, you know, the inside matches the outside. So, but, <laughs> you know, I just, so my question is, is, I just got back from Israel a few months ago. 
And my heart goes out for the Palestinians. And as I read your book, I could tell yours does as well. How can we as American Christians state our displeasure with some of the Israeli political stances without being anti-Semitic? Yeah, that, that's the big question. I just spoke about this a couple of weeks ago at a church in Elgin, Illinois. There were actually like 12 churches that were there. And there was, there's, first of all, I, we always have to make the distinction between the Israeli government and the Jewish people. Now they're very close together, but in Israel, there's lots of criticism of the government. So it's fine to criticize government policy, but there's something called the 3D test. And this is, this is how we test whether something is simply a criticism of Israel, which is fine or anti-Semitism. So the first D is if our words delegitimize the Jewish state, if we were to say, you know what, you know, there, there, the Jewish state was built on a lie. It was built as a catat, you know, there are some on the Palestinian side who call the creation of the state of Israel the Nakba, which means the catastrophe. So if we're using that language to say, you know, the whole idea, the whole creation of the Jewish state was a catastrophe, was destructive, then we're, 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 we're going over into anti-Semitism because that's delegitimizing. That's say that the Jewish people do not have a right to self-determination into a country. And so that's one measure. And, and there are people on the, on the far left who, who really do think that the whole idea of a Jewish state is wrong. So that's one D, delegitimization. The set, the second D is demonization. And this is where we say, so, there, there are people on the far left, and of course the far right, I'm, but who say such outrageous things, you know, Jews are poisoning Palestinian wells. And, and I mean, there, there are actually academics who write books saying basically the whole, the Israeli army deliberately, you know, maims and injures civilians to, 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 to beat down the population. I mean, there, there, there are these outrageous charges that are out there. So this demonization that, are, is so outside the pale that it's almost like conspiracy theory. That, that is anti-Semitism. The third D is double standards. And this, this one's a, this one's a little harder to police, but the, the idea is that if all of our political criticism, if every time we talk about injustice, we're only talking about Israel, the Palestinians, and we're not talking about Syria and the half a million people murdered there, and we're not talking about China and all that, if all of our attention is on Israel, then that raises questions as to as to our motivations. So I think those three things. Again, it's not black and white. It's very hard to to distinguish. But if but if we find that our language crosses over into those three areas, then we're in danger of being anti-Semitic. Well, let's not forget the United States as well. I mean, right now we're running internment camps. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is this is uh, it's very sad. So yeah, I mean. It, in these Jewish high holy days that are coming up, one of the things that I try to do is to say, you know, it's easy to to point to everybody else, but you know, how are we doing? What are we doing in our own backyard? For sure, we have to look closely at ourselves. Hey, this is Kenneth Wilson, the music guy behind the Happy Hippie Jesus Show. If you like what you're hearing, go to Apple Podcasts and rate the show five stars. If you don't rate it five stars, Jesus will know. Can I ask a follow-up question about the double standard one? Yeah. Because I find on some levels, I completely agree. And on some levels, I find that like difficult. Part of what upsets me most about what's happening in the U.S. now is I expect more from our government. Yeah. Or I expect more from us as a people. Is it fair to say I expect more from Israel or so, I expect okay. Israel to be better or to do better? That is a phenomenal question. And it's a very deep question. And it's a question that Jews have struggled with for a hundred years. So, so when the Jewish state was founded, the new modern Jewish state, 120 years ago, there was a raging debate. And the debate was about what kind of country do we want to be? Do we want to see ourselves as a light unto the nations, as, as a recreation of the biblical Israel, a city on a hill, and that we will be moral exemplars for the world? There were some of the early founders of the Jewish state who did see the Jewish state that way, that we are going to hold ourselves to a higher standard because we're rooted in Jewish values. But then there were others who said, you know what? Forget about it. We're going to be a state just like any other. 
you know, yes, we'll try to do our best. But you know what? We've experienced so much anti-Semitism, so much hatred that we just want to survive. And, you know, if we have to if we have to ruffle a few feathers while we build the state, that's what we have to do. So that debate still exists within Israel. There are, though, and within American Jews, there are some who say, you know what? We expect the best of a Jewish state. And, you know, if you look at the at the Israeli Defense Forces, the army, their code of conduct is very, very highly ethical and strict and 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 the kind of policies that soldiers are supposed to follow. It's really it's extraordinary. And the kind of, you know, if Israel does ever do do bombings in Palestinian areas after there have been rocket attacks, they actually drop leaflets all over saying civilians, please leave, you know, that that there's going to be. You know, so there there are certain ways that the that the army tries to be extremely ethical but then there are other voices within israel to say you know what we live in a tough neighborhood there are thugs around us all the time and we just we're going to play by by the rules of the jungle so you have both those voices competing in modern israel i was in israel at the exact same time that our current administration recognized golem heights as Israeli territory and some of the bombings occurred. We went through both Palestinian territory and Israeli territory during that time, felt completely safe, and I didn't see anything mm-hmm. unethical happening during that, that period. Yeah, I mean, the truth is, it's pretty safe and people get along pretty well. Almost like anywhere, like it's it's kind of, you know, I'm in Chicago. You can go into what are considered, really, you know, you hear about Chicago in the news all the time. And yes, there are certain places you don't want to be at, you know, two in the morning. But in general, most places are fine if you keep to yourself. And, you know, so, so most of most of the Palestinian areas and the in, in Israel, people get along OK. It's, it's the incidents. It's a certain incidents that draw so much attention. I really believe that most most Palestinians and most Israelis want to get along. And, and it's, it's the extremists on both sides who really make it impossible. I'm, I, I, I often say I'm short-term pessimistic, but long-term optimistic. I mean, I think Israel, Israel is going to survive as a country. And, you know, it lives in a, in a neighborhood filled with millions and millions of Arabs and, and Muslims that we have to get along with. And I think when, when we can kind of get past these 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 ancient hatreds, we'll be able to find a way people already have. So, you know, when you're on the ground, you can kind of see that there is cause for hope. It's when the it's it's in the news media that often makes us feel despondent. There may be some people out there that they're not religious, they're not anti Semitic, they're not anti Christian, not pro Christian. They're they're pretty much just right there in the middle, just don't care one way or another. And they want to they may want to know why does anti-Semitism matter to them? I think it matters to them because it's it's the kind of society we want to live in. The societies that have hated Jews are always the societies that have fallen apart. You know, if you want to look at it strictly from a historical level, look at look at Nazi Germany. Germany had one of the greatest civilizations up until World War II, or really World War One, but you know. And when it's Jews left and when the society started targeting Jews, I mean, Albert Einstein came from Germany, all the Robert Oppenheimer, all the great scientists who came to the United States and helped us win the war. They they were Jews. And so a society that that hates its Jewish citizens falls apart because it's a hateful society. So if we want to be a great society, a society that's pluralistic and open and welcoming and and, and, and that can meet the needs of its citizens. We want a society that's welcoming to Jews. In some ways, Jews are a litmus test for a society. It's really, it's a, it's a beautiful, it, it's sort of a, a sad truth in history that societies that have hated Jews are societies that have hated so many other people. So even if I, I've gotten so many letters from people after this book came out who never met somebody Jewish, maybe they live in a small town, you know, in, in Arkansas or in, or in uh, Louisiana, and and you know they they may maybe never met somebody Jewish, or there's no Jews who live in their town who feel a passionate concern about this issue. And I think part of it is because they recognize that a society that is hateful towards Jews is hateful to many others. 
I think that's why it matters. And, and that's true today, and it's been true in history. I would struggle to find someone in a modern America that doesn't think we have a hate problem at the moment, particularly after, the, I guess, the events of the last few weeks. What, I guess, what were some things highlight for some people who, you know, I guess it's easy if you're not Jewish to just not pay attention to the media. So if you would just highlight some things for us that you've kind of seen happening in the media or in, you know, U.S. culture and things that have kind of caused you to become more concerned and ultimately led to you writing this book, just things that are happening now in modern America. Well, you saw it. I mean, really, the last four years have seen the most. This The trend started in, in 2001 where Israel was increasingly demonized at the United Nations. And then after September 11th, there were there was a whole conspiracy theory that gained a lot of traction that said, you know, Jews secretly, Israel secretly planned the World Trade Center bombings, you know, and this was a big underground conspiracy theory. And then you saw stuff on college campuses. But really, in the 2015 election, there was this emergence of the alt-right, which were very far right, I'm not talking about just politically conservative. These were far right hate mongers who believed that Jews represent cosmopolitan or, or Jews represent multiculturalism and difference and that undermining American pride and the American white race and that they, that, that Judaism stands for everything wrong with the kind of global world in which we live. And as nothing, you know, the biggest target of anti-Semitism online in 2016 was a guy named Ben Shapiro, who is very far right. He was a Ted Cruz supporter. And yet the alt-right despised him because he's Jewish. And he, and he says America is not about its race. It's about our values. And so I think this alt-right that is, is so obsessed with race, that I have seen really emerge since 2015. And also, I think that this is a, a, a historical truth and something that I'm going to be speaking about in, in the Jewish holidays is that whenever anti-immigrant sentiment has grown, whenever this nativist sentiment has grown in America, it's also been a bad time for Jews. The worst time for Jews was in the 1930s. And that was also a period after World War I when America was extremely isolationist and didn't let in many immigrants. And so this kind of anti-immigrant culture, you know, I'm, I'm sympathetic to having a strong border and all this. And, you know, I, 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 I'm not, I'm not a open borders guy, but when a culture value, you know, uh, demonizes immigrants, then it tends to demonize other people who are different. So that's really what's worried me over the last couple of years. And that's from the right. Then on the left, there's the far left movement that, that views Israel as this apartheid oppressive state. And that disturbs me too. So I'm kind of fighting on, on, on two fronts. And looking for kind of reasonable middle where uh, we can see that Israel and the Jewish people, just like anyone else, we have our flaws, we have our problems, but we also have our strengths and, and, and trying to kind of work with, with, with people on both sides. And I see both strains of anti-Semitism from the far right and the far left really growing. What I want to know right now, because we're brothers and sisters, we, we come yeah. from the same lineage. What can the church do to help to turn the tide away from anti-Semitism? I think one, one part is simply education. So becoming aware of, uh, the, the, the dangers of saying Jews killed Jesus. And especially in times like Good Friday and Easter Sunday, kind of reinforcing a less, th these lessons that sort of seeing the gospels in this traditional way can really hurt us. And also educating people on the Jewishness of Jesus. I mean, that's how my whole, that's how my whole mission got started. I taught a class at a, at a church and really people wanted me to teach more. And then I wrote a book on Passover and I wrote a book on the Jewishness of Jesus. So I, I say educating people in churches, people want to learn. Not only do, not only do people want to learn about Judaism because it can deepen our closeness to Jesus if you're Christian, but people also, there's lots of interfaith marriage and people have Jewish members of their family. So learning about Judaism is one thing. Secondly, I think uh, having dialogue, having pulpit exchanges with churches, uh, I've spoken probably, I made a list about a year ago, and after that, I'd spoken at 120 churches. It was amazing. From Unitarian to evangelical, far-right evangelical. So, I've spoke, so I really, having, 
having uh, education where we can go in each other's houses of worship and learn together is really important. Uh, I'd say traveling to Israel. If you can pull together a trip to Israel and take members of the church there, that's transformative. Those kinds of experiences, I think, can really heal and help. You've been doing a lot of interfaith work over the last several years. You've written some books about you know, the Jewishness of Jesus. You've been speaking in churches. I'm curious, how has that interfaith work kind of shaped your faith or shaped how you understand God? Oh, it's had an enormous impact. I really, I think about this. I talk about it with my wife all the time because my wife is also a rabbi and she also does a lot of interfaith work. And I think it's deepened. I, I think it's it's really deepen my, my, my sense of faith. In some ways, you know, Judaism is sometimes, and it really is, it's a religion of practice. It's a religion of deed more than creed, what we do rather than what we believe. There isn't as much discussion of theology. And I've actually seen in churches that there's much greater discussion of theology and about our personal relationship with God. And I didn't grow up in a synagogue where we talked about that much. And I've actually talked about that a lot more in churches than I have in synagogues. So it's actually, I think, made me a a more theologically deep and and aware person. Uh, I spent one year, this was about four or five years ago, studying the book of Deuteronomy with a uh, with a minister in town. And the kinds of discussions and faith, you know, faith discussions we had really were profound. So I think it's only enriched my sense of faith. And I, I think that's what that's what interfaith dialogue at its best can do. We we our own our own faith is not threatened by the faith strong faith of another person it's can be enriched by it when we come to it with the with confidence and with the right approach now as we've talked today every rabbi i have ever spoken to has this deep knowledge and understanding of the new testament would mm-hmm. it be good for christians to understand their jewishness as well absolutely i really I think the more the more Christians can really understand Judaism, not only does it make our faith more interesting, but it also can help people grow closer to Jesus because Jesus practiced Judaism. Jesus knew the Jewish tradition so well. Jesus probably had a bar mitzvah, uh, you know. With, so there, there, there's so much to be gained by it, you know. And, and there's it, it's complicated. Some some Jews prefer that the lines remain very strict. That Christians are Christians, Jews are Jews, and neither the two, never the two shall meet. I, I don't, I think we live in a world where those traditional boundaries are much more porous than they once were. So I like people learning about other faiths. It doesn't mean we weaken our own, you know, but, but we can sort of mix and match and grow as human beings. And I, I think that, I really think in many ways, the, 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 the difficulties today are often between people of no faith and people of faith. And a truly robust faith can make a difference in the world, can make us closer to one another, can bring a certain kind of dignity and kindness. Uh, so I think the more we learn with and from each other, the better. I wonder if you might offer us a word about how we can interact and learn and just talk with people of other faiths without trying to convert someone to our faith or convince someone that we're right or we're wrong. But what's a way that we can approach that that's helpful? Uh, this is a very good question. I, you know, I don't know if I have a ideal answer. My my best advice is just just to give people the benefit of the doubt and not always have our guard up. I mean, I've been in situations where I was made uncomfortable by just the way somebody was saying, you know, I've been in a church where it said, well, we want to teach the rabbi about Jesus, you know, and it kind of could come across that, you know, and I knew that that wasn't the intent. I think some... We have to just sort of give people the benefit of the doubt. I, 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 I don't always want people to feel like they're walking on eggshells. So I think approaching people with an openness to say, you know, I want to talk with you. You know, here's what I believe about Jesus. Tell me what you believe about Jesus. Not, not in a way that, that is, is trying to feel like you're pushing conversion. And then if you're Jewish, you know, don't always there are some Jews out there who think anytime somebody mentions Jesus, they're trying to convert you to Christianity. And that's understandable because Jews have faced anti-Semitism for so long. So there is a kind of fear of people trying to convert Jews. And Jews are such a small people. But I tell, I tell my fellow rabbis and congregants, you know, give people the benefit of the doubt. You know, we can learn from other people's faith. And the fact, you know, 
the fact that some people do want to convert Jews, it, it bothers me if they're pushy. But in the grand scheme of things, I have my faith, someone has their faith, and we can learn from each other even if we don't agree on everything. So kind of giving people the benefit of the doubt and recognizing that there may still be some differences, but that's okay. You know, one of the things that I love, the best interfaith dialogues I've had at churches have been one where we talk about the difficult texts. I always tell people, you know, we can all agree that peace and love are good. There's nothing, we love all that. But where the conversation gets interesting is when we talk about areas where we disagree in a respectful way, in a, in a you know, you never don't want to, don't want to personalize things, but where we can really talk about our differences, those are the most interesting conversations. So be willing, be willing to go there, but do it in a respectful way. I'm wondering about interfaith ministry together. What, what are some interfaith ministries that might be able to grow the bonds between Christianity and Judaism? Well, there's a lot of interesting. So one project that's happening in Omaha is it's called the Tri-Faith Campus, I think, something like that. And it's a church, a synagogue, and a mosque share space together. And it's really amazing. I, I, I don't know whether they share a campus. I don't know whether they share the same sanctuary. I don't think so. But they de- definitely share office space. They share grounds. Uh, and, and that's been a, an incredible model. And it's worked out really well so far. So that's one area. Another area that my wife is involved in, you know, in Chicago, we have a big Catholic population. And so there's a, a really wonderful church downtown where they have something called a family school. And these are families where one parent is Jewish and one is Catholic. And they've created a joint school where they're learning together. And the parents are the teachers. And I tell you, I know a lot of these kids. They are incredible. Some of them end up choosing Judaism when they're older. Some choose Catholicism. Some some choose Christianity. They're Protestant. Some some just find themselves spiritual but not religious. But they have a deep sense of faith, and it works. So those kinds of partnerships are really good. Again, it's not everybody's cup of tea. Some people look at that and say, "Oh, they're watering down this and that." And what about all the theological differences? And I get all that. That's all true. But you know what? We're human beings, and we figure out a way to make it work. So I think those kind of models where we're sharing space and where we're even sharing teachings, that's the world in which we live. And if we can figure out good models, I think a lot of it comes down to the right clergy. When you have clergy that can really respect and, and, and work well together, that can make those kinds of communities possible. Before we leave, we end our discussions every week with this question. Yeah. What is it that's saving your soul right now? I mean, conversations like this. I mean, the fact that we can have these conversations, you're in Arkansas, I'm in Chicago, you're pastors, I'm a rabbi, and we can have this meaningful discussion. And you just came back from Israel. And, you know, these kinds of conversations would have been unheard of 50 years ago. You know, pastors and rabbis, maybe they would meet once a year for some civic occasion, but they didn't have these kinds of meaningful conversations. So this, this gives me hope. I I really, I love it. I feel like I've kind of been blessed to to have these kinds of conversations, be able to do this all the time. And, and I love it. Bill puts all of your information in our show notes for us and we'll link to your book and everything because he does the, he's the only one that does any work on our podcast, but is there <laughs> any special project that you're working on right now that you want to share with people or any way that people can connect with you on social media? Sure. I mean, you can always go to rabbi Mafic. Dot com. That's my website, and it has stuff about all my books. And and uh, we talked about the first the Jews book. My next book um, is con- is is sort of the most general book, and it's going to, going to be called "What Every Christian Needs to Know About Judaism: Exploring the Ever Evolving World of Christians and Jews." Very similar to what we talked about today. Oh wow! And it's oh. yeah, and it's so that one's going to be coming out. Um, you know, I think it's going to be January, February. It's already actually up on Amazon. Um, so that that's my next project. And uh, and I also I speak at lots of churches. And so I love traveling and speaking. So anyone can reach out to me and uh, and, and we can have a discussion about that. All right. Well, can yeah. we can we book you already to come back and talk about your next book? Absolutely. I'd be honored. <laughs> uh, we might have to have you back between now and then to talk about your first book about the Jewishness of Jesus. 
Well, thank you so much, Evan. This has been uh, enlightening. It has been fun. And uh, it has been a holy moment. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. So good to talk with you guys. 